All right, we're going live, bro. Hey, everyone. An amazing Ivy Day congratulations. I'm here with our co-founder, Fungjo. Do you want to introduce yourself, FC? Hey, everyone. Um, very exciting uh, news coming in for the last few hours. Um, you know, for those of you who are seniors graduating, you know, congratulations for um, getting some good news. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm a co-founder at Crimson Education, been working very closely with Jamie, uh, supporting a lot of students uh, around the world uh, over the past 11 years. Um, yeah, very, very exciting here uh, to be here today. Amazing. Hey, guys, for those of you who are new to our streams, my name is Jamie. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Crimson Education. A bit of background, back in high school, I applied to a wide range of U.S. schools, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Columbia, Wharton, as well as U.K. schools like Cambridge, got into all of those schools. We then launched Crimson Together back in 2013 to guide the best and brightest young minds into these amazing institutions, which have been so transformational in our lives. Following that, I headed off to Harvard for my undergraduate and master's degrees in applied math, Stanford for an MBA in education master's, Oxford for the Rhodes Scholarship, Yale for law school, Princeton for an infant, Tsinghua with Feng Zhou for our Schwartzman scholars, which was super fun, and also UPenn. So many of the schools our students are getting into today, we've personally studied that, and it's been an amazing ride. Um, FC, do you want to share a bit about your own academic background? Of course. My uh, background, unfortunately, is nowhere near as impressive as Jamie's. Um, I, I grew up in China, did my um, high school in New Zealand. That's where I met Jamie. Um, fortunately, when I graduated, I was... Uh, the country's first ever uh, international student to receive uh, the premier scholarship, which is the highest academic honor um, in the country, um, received the award in parliament um, from the prime minister, uh, then did my undergrad in computer science and business on a full scholarship uh, before a master's degree at uh, Stanford Engineering, uh, studying management science and engineering, um, also got into MIT, Columbia, a bunch of other schools. Uh, following that, I went back to China uh, to do my second uh, fellowship called Sch uh, Schwarzman Scholars alongside Jamie, um, which was very, super fun. And then I got uh, the John F. Kennedy uh, Fellowship at Harvard uh, to pursue an MBA as well as uh, an MBA at Stanford Graduate School of Business. I uh, also got into other schools uh, during the process like Wharton and other places on uh, uh, substantial scholarships. So yeah. Um, Amazing. Definitely. Amazing. So today, uh, as you guys know, is Ivy Day. <clears throat> All eight schools released their offers. Uh, and so, so far, we have more than 112 kids around the world that have gotten into Ivy League schools, which has been pretty mind-blowing. Um, FC, any particular students so far come to mind that have really, you know, blown you away with their results? Definitely, definitely. I've got a student um, who uh, grew up in China um, and um, you know, went to international uh, schools in China. And uh, when he applied to boarding school uh, in, in the US, unfortunately, you know, uh, things didn't go well or as well as expected. And he, he went over to uh, study uh, in a premium boarding school uh, in Switzerland. And just now I was checking with him uh, how he went and he said, oh, no good news, unfortunately. And I was uh, a little bit uh, shocked. I thought, you know, he got all rejections. and. As I dig further, um, he, he was waitlisted by Harvard, but he got into Dartmouth, Duke, um, Northwestern, Johns Hopkins, Vanderbilt, uh, Carnegie Mellon, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I mean, super, super exciting, super happy, um, you know, work with him for the last three years. And, uh, you know, also, you know, alongside Jamie, and it's, it's super uh, incredible to see uh, the results he's able to uh, receive, and he's also waiting on Stanford, which is coming out uh, in less than 24 hours. So I think uh, this student definitely has amazing academic work ethic. The funny thing about him is, you know, he's a very academic guy, and I met some other students from his high school, and I was curious how he was perceived by his peers. And, you know, I, I had the impression he might be quite, a, quite an academic fellow, uh, not so much into, you know, social world. And I asked uh, his classmates, and apparently he's a party animal, but he just got into the Ivy League. So look at that. He can do it all. Uh, my favorite highlight from uh, this submissions round so far, I've had a lot, um, but one is a young girl called Jade Skeets. Jade grew up in Kerry, Kerry, New Zealand. You know, as you guys may know, I'm a Kiwi, grew up in New Zealand too. Um, and, you know, Jade initially uh, was at a small public high school and she was doing a national curriculum. She wasn't that fulfilled as far as, you know, potentially, you know, all the different um, academic options she had. 
She switched into our Crimson Global Academy, which is an accredited online high school. Uh, she spent three years learning with us, and she just found out today that she got into Columbia University as well as Princeton University, two of the world's best schools, Princeton being the highest ranked college in the world right now on the US News ranking. So it's incredible to see her story of persistence. You know, she's an amazing musician, a ballet um, star. You know, she's really, really fantastic in academics, worked so hard over all these years and seeing her results coming to fruition, you know, super inspiring. Uh, and one of the things I do love about the admissions process is unlike the UK, the US really looks to find unique students that have a narrative that really stands distinct. It could be through extracurriculars, it could be through hardship, it could be through leadership, whatever it is. And in many of our students, you know, we see that spark, that magic that really captivates the admissions office. Another one of my students just gained admission from Arizona, a dear student of mine who is actually, uh, I think, going to be a ferocious business tycoon in the future. Um, so, you know, watch out Cheryl Sandberg or, you know, maybe Indra from uh, Pepsi. Um, our student from Arizona is coming for you. She just got into the Wharton Business School, the world's highest ranked undergraduate business school. She had some amazing initiatives, um, initiatives like Health for Her, an incredible uh, social impact, social entrepreneurship initiative um, to really uh, raise the health standards of women around the world. Um, all kinds of impressive leadership roles for, you know, local um, politicians and other advocacy work and just got into Wharton, an amazing result uh, for, for our students. So very, very proud of her. So there are a couple of questions we're going to be really dissecting today. Um, everything from, you know, uh, what are some trends that we're seeing as far as admissions rates, news, hot off the different Ivy League schools? You know, what are some trends around affirmative action? How has affirmative action, um, the change really banning the consideration of race, affected admissions in America this cycle? How are things like the SAT, um, you know, test optional compulsory dynamics changing? What are some of our favorite admission stories from the journey? What are some key learnings? And of course, you guys are welcome to ask any questions you like. We're on both YouTube and Instagram at the moment. So you'll, you know, go, go for it, ask anything you like, and we will, you know, answer anything as we go through our wonderful stream today. We're also going to have some fantastic members of the Crimson community jumping in, um, particularly on our Instagram stream, to go ahead and share some insights as well. And you're going to get really a wonderful Ivy Day coverage. Um, so I guess with that, FC, any interesting trends you want to share hot off the press from the 2024 regular admissions round? Absolutely. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, one word to describe it is competitive. I, I, I guess we all know that it is going to be extremely uh, competitive year, given that a lot of the schools or, or many schools uh, reported a, a significant increase in the, the admissions. But um, we, we can see schools like uh, Penn, for instance, um, you know, where a, uh, the, the student from Arizona just got into um, had 10% increase uh, in the application numbers, reaching all the way to 65,000, which is just incredible. Um, I, I, you know, only a few years ago, right, Penn was only dealing with, uh, you know, 40 or so thousand uh, applicants, and now it's, you know, a, a much larger number than that. And because of that, uh, the, the the result acceptance rate is going down quite a lot as well. And and for Duke, uh, the regular decision uh, stats uh, or acceptance rate was also about uh, 4.1%, um, extremely, yeah, pretty much record low as well. So definitely seeing some uh, extremely uh, tough competition out there. What about you? What, what are your... Um, top observations, Jamie. Well, one thing that's interesting this year is actually some of the Ivy League schools decreased in acceptance, uh, rather increased in acceptance rates um, for the year. So, uh, for example, um, some of the schools like Harvard had an actually higher emissions, ra emissions rate for the general round this year, this time last year. And some of the reasons for that are idiosyncratic to do with some of the political tension around Harvard, you know, the, the president having to stand down, some of the issues around DEI, the Israel-Hamas conflict uh, and some of the tension that, you know, led to around university presidents in general. Um, but in particular, um, when it comes to Harvard, you know, a lot of kids were applying test optional during COVID waves. And now candidates are tightening up substantially in terms of which schools they're applying to if they don't have those high test scores. So um, there's been some stabilization in Ivy League acceptance rates. Some schools, though, got more competitive. Columbia, for example, we believe hit its record peak selectivity this year which is, you know, amazing. Columbia is a hard school to beat, right in the heart of New York City. Absolutely amazing. You know, super fun um, place to be. And amazing if you want to get into like Wall Street, finance, any of that good stuff. 
Um, also, a beautiful question just came in from our live viewers here on Instagram. Um, uh, Anka asks, Jamie, I've just finished your book. As a preparation, I'd like to have my kids start as early as possible. Is it possible to study for AP at Crimson starting on uh, year eight? Absolutely. We have the Crimson Global Academy specifically designed to take along extra APs. If I was sending my own child through the admissions process or you know, a student wanting to begin early, I would get them to do APs as early as possible. There are a lot of APs like AP Psychology, AP Statistics, AP Computer Science, Principles, you can take from a young age. And I would absolutely jump on that because then you can stagger that out over more years. Some of our most legendary Crimson students, like Andrew, who's now uh, almost finishing his time at Harvard, took um, about 15 APs in high school outside of school. And to get those amazing results, you do want to start nice and early. What are your thoughts on that one, FC? I 100% agree. Um, when we run our analysis on um, the, uh, I guess, between the acceptance and also the number of APs and, and the grades, we can still see a very strong, um, I guess, you know, correlation between uh, the two. Uh, definitely, uh, assuming that you can maintain very strong academic performance is pretty critical to uh, hit a, a larger number of APs. Uh, when you get to junior year, um, things are going to get busier and busier, very competitive. So you do want to uh, take advantage of your you know, freshman year or even younger to uh, get some of the easier APs out of the way. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely encourage that. So you can go ahead and reach out. Um, the email address, by the way, uh, for that family, um, Agka, uh, you can go ahead and email um, me at j.beaton. Uh, at crimsoneducation.org. That's j.beaton at crimsoneducation.org. Um, I will go ahead and connect you to the best person on our team, probably Penny, uh, one of our legendary leaders in the organization that can help you get set up with some awesome Crimson Global Academy firepower. We've also soon got a, a veteran of Crimson, Kim, joining us. Um, Kim is uh, the leader of our US team, and her daughter, Claudia, was actually an early Crimson student who ended up getting into Princeton. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if we can welcome Kim to the um to the stream uh let's see how this works should be quite good fun and yeah to your question i'll go ahead and type my email here in the chat so if you do want to uh jump in you can kim welcome 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 hey guys happy ivy day happy ivy day happy ivy day it's like christmas it's my favorite day of the year I ordered cookies yesterday to celebrate. I've been munching them all day. They're dangerously big cookies. I'm going to have to go for a run. Yeah, it's so exciting. I think as, as you guys both know, uh, you really do get to know these students along the way. And there's this nervousness you have for them, even though, you know, they're well prepared and they put all the work in and you're counting down to, um, in our case, on the East Coast of the US 7 p.m. And uh, just, I don't know, it was like magic. Watching these lives being changed one after the other after the other, so it's very exciting. No, it's yeah, absolutely incredible. I mean, especially some of these students who join us when they're. I think of my student in Australia who joined us when she was nine. You know oh, that, wow. you know, incredible. And um, I was so proud of her recently. She got a uh, awesome John Locke Award, um, John Locke Junior, uh, second in the world in John Locke Junior. Incredible, incredible, <coughs> incredible uh, results. But yeah, uh, it's really cool because this is a process which rewards compounding and starting early. Um, you know, we had yeah. someone just mentioned in the chat, for example, that, um, you know, she wanted to get a, you know, her, I think her child getting started with APs nice and early. Love the strategy. So uh, any particular interesting trends you've spotted FC? I know you've been closely monitoring emission stats coming in hold off press worldwide, um, you know, particularly tapping into the, the hardcore world of WeChat, which is deep when it comes to emissions data from our uh, Chinese team. Go for it, FC. Any, any hot trends? Um... I mean, as, uh, I guess um, as uh, the, the, the results unveils, we will see more and more interesting information. But I guess um, for a lot of the schools uh, that used to be safety schools, I think they're no longer really uh, safety schools, uh, you know, in, in recent years. Um, I, I remember my conversation with um, one, one of my um, uh, families, um, the dad who went to MIT, uh, and when I recommended um, Tufts to uh, his daughter, and um, and he was like, you know, no, absolutely not, right? Like, you know, Tufts is a 
you know, a safety of the safety. I'm like, look, like, look at, guess what the acceptance rate for Tuft is this year. And it was like, maybe, I don't know, 45% and, you know, it's 10%, right? So um, although, you know, it's it's been competitive like that for the last couple of years, but, you know, it's, it's still pretty um, important to realize that uh, how competitive, uh, you know, these schools in Boston, right? Like in particular, uh, got and also same goes with Northeastern. Almost had almost a little bit, uh, just a, a little over one thousand, shy from a hundred thousand applicants this year, uh, which is just incredible. So, um, yeah, there are many kind of interesting uh, insights, um, you know, that we've put together, and I guess as we uh, progress, we'll uh, share our uh, our our view. Um, but I guess, you know, right now, if, you know, if you're watching, if you have an offer, you know, definitely celebrate, you know, given that you're one of the, you know, very uh, small group of uh, students that have that great news. But uh, if you're, you know, preparing for um, college applications uh, in the coming years, um, I think it's critical, critical to um, really understand uh, the evolving kind of profile that these top colleges are looking for. Um, I definitely think there is a growing need to um, really establish that point of differentiation because I feel like it's definitely harder and harder to um, really, um, you know, stand out from the rest of the application pool. And I guess, you know, from a micro perspective, we see uh, students with, uh, especially students who are interested in STEM and business, we see an increasing uh, number of students uh, with uh, very solid humanities. Um, you know, do well when your main uh, interest is STEM or business. Um, for, for those who are only, uh, you know, who only care about STEM or who only uh, is passionate about business, uh, I think it's getting tougher uh, given that um, lack of balance uh, in the uh, holistic evaluation process and also, I guess, sort of the fit uh, uh, between their profile and uh, what liberal arts education uh, really represents. But yeah, so if you have like a very solid uh, humanities angle, uh, good exposure, especially in literature, in classics, in you know other different languages, uh, that will help you go a long way, even when you're applying uh, for computer science or, uh, or, or business or other uh, very competitive majors. So Kim, I know you're excited about a couple of students that have just gotten hot off the press. You've you've, you've been studying. You know, uh, tell us some examples. Any amazing stories? Yeah, I've got, I've got quite a few tonight. Um, one student in particular who we've been, we've been working with, as you said, Jamie, since I think uh, uh, it was even before freshman year, so I, I think grade eight. Um, and this was a student who uh, a very I guess you would say shy student at the time, um, very softly spoken. And over the years, just watching her come out of a shell. And at the beginning, I don't think she was even capable of applying to an IVs. And tonight, she actually got into Brown and Columbia. So I'm personally excited about that one. Um, but there are so many. I'm going to get on the phone tonight and talk to a couple of families just to congratulate them personally. And, and um, yeah, I know that even more news will be coming in tomorrow. It's just wow. important. So pretty exciting. Guys, 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 one of our students just got into the UPenn Huntsman program and Cornell and NYU and UCLA. That is super insane. So to give you guys some context, um, the Huntsman program is the most selective dual degree program uh, in the world, actually. Um, it, it's a combined program, international studies and business at the Warden Business School um, at UPenn. And this is really... a uh, awesome because it combines the target language, business, international studies. A lot of folks get into Wall Street, get into the United Nations, et cetera. We have now sent, um, we've had more than 11 offers just from the Huntsman program. One of my students, Charlotte, is a graduate of the Huntsman program, is now working at McKinsey. But um, what's amazing is in this super competitive cycle, uh, the student from the UK managed to land that offer and Cornell as well. It's also very hard to get into the Huntsman program in the regular round, but uh, the team has done the magic, amazing, amazing stuff. Shout out to Allison, Patrick, the the whole crew for pulling that off. Yeah, awesome. Uh, very exciting night. All right, I'll leave you guys too. I'm gonna make a few calls to some families that I'm going to talk to. I have one Amazing. question. I have one question for you, Kim, before you go. Yeah. You know, as a parent, right? Back in back in the moment when Claudia was checking her acceptance results, what was that night like for you? How did you feel? Tell us the story. 
I think we we might have lost your audio. I don't oh, know. If, oh, yeah, you go for it. Um, Amazing, amazing. Uh, I know, for example, when I checked my Harvard result, um, I was uh, on the phone with my mum and she burst into tears. And then I actually went I went to a movie cinema that day to watch a movie called uh, The Hobbit. And I cannot remember a single minute from the movie because my head was spinning for the whole day. Um, and I did drop an embarrassing Facebook post announcing that I had just gotten in, uh, which was uh, pretty funny. But, you know, I was super excited. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. See you, Kim. All right, guys. Um, that was wonderful to hear from Kim. Soon we've got a legend of Crimson, a guy called Akesh, joining the stream. Now, Akesh is a real legend when it comes to academics because he achieved six top in the worlds in high school, which is a record, as far as I know, in New Zealand history for A-level results. After that, he won a full scholarship to Cambridge University, um, and then he went to Bain & Company, one of the world's most elite management consulting firms, which many of our kids aspire to go to. And then he went to Harvard Business School, uh, which you know is really... Um, as a Stanford business school grad, I'm going to say it's the first equal, maybe maybe the first, maybe the best business school in the world. Uh, it's a tight competition. So Akesh is going to join the stream soon. He's been crunching numbers. He's going to come in hot off the press with some really good insights. And um, uh, I will go ahead and see if I can find him in this storm of folks and admit him. If you want to go ahead and send a request, let me see. Uh, Akesh, boom, found you. Uh, I like your Instagram tag, Akesh. Um, very cheeky stuff, very cheeky. All right, let's see if we can bring him in here and welcome him. And feel free to ask any of your data-driven questions. Akesh is the guy. Uh, he's coming in here a lot. And by the way, someone asks, do you think Kumon math is a good extracurricular activity worth pursuing? Kumon math doesn't count as an extracurricular activity. It's more just like a style of tutoring. Um, I think it's actually better to do things like IGCSE math, pre-IGCSE math, and actually start learning like actual credentials that you can help. Um, I don't mind coming when, when, when our kids are younger, um, but yeah, Akesh, welcome, welcome to the fun. Oh, hello, can you guys hear me? Loud and clear. All right, amazing. Uh, I'm loving the, uh, all of the Ivy swag. I got my... Uh, oh, I love, love it, love it, love it. There we go. <laughs> uh, but, but gosh, oh my gosh, uh, I mean, IBJ uh, for us at Crimson is literally Christmas on so many levels. Um, I think we already spoke a bunch about um, all of the student stories, like how exciting it is. Uh, for each of our students, I mean, I can barely keep up. Like every five seconds, it seems like there is another Crimson student who is getting into one of these IDs, which is absolutely incredible. Um, while we let our Crimson tally kind of, uh, kind of catch up and sum, sum all those numbers up, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, Ivy Day is also uh, Christmas for us at Crimson for another reason, which is uh, there is a bunch of data that suddenly gets released out into the wild in terms of like what is actually going on in these admission offices. Um, and so I am very excited uh, to share uh, a little bit in terms of what's going on. Uh, one interesting tidbit before I jump in, though, is that um, generally universities are reporting less and less data. Uh, the IVs are getting quite tight-lipped about what they're uh, sharing with folks. Um, it's interesting. Princeton's Dean of Admissions, uh, Karen Richardson, a couple of years ago said that uh, they don't want to discourage prospective students from applying to some of these universities. Um, by sharing some of these statistics that make them seem so selective. Um, I think we take a pretty different view of this at Crimson. You know, we want to get every single piece of data out there that we can possibly get our hands on um, so that all of you have uh, the absolute uh, best information out there as you make decisions uh, for next cycle, maybe the, the cycle following, maybe if you're waitlisted. Um, I think more information is always better. So, um, so guys, are you ready for me to share? Uh, some of uh, some some of the insights that I've managed to glean. Like I said, there isn't a lot of data out there, but I've managed to get my hands you, on as much as I can. You hit it, Akesh. And by the way, for our YouTube viewers, feel free to go ahead and join us on the Crimson Education Instagram, so you can hear from our special guests like Akesh sharing their insights. We're going to, of course, be getting back into our regular content with FCNI, but um, for the moment, we're going to be listening to Akesh's hot of the press data. Over to you, Akesh. All right, amazing. Okay, so I'm going to hit you guys with uh, a couple key insights that I've gleaned. Um, so the first is, I know today is Ivy Day, um, but I actually want to talk about a school that isn't technically designated an Ivy school. 
Um, I think it, it doesn't have the technical designation of being an IV, but I truly believe it deserves to be right up there. Um, and I think I see FCU have some Stanford swag on. It's not Stanford. I know you're going to jump in there and say, it's probably Stanford that I want to talk about. Everyone hold your horses on Stanford. That's tomorrow, right? Um, the school I want to talk about today is, uh, is Duke. And wow. I know these guys, uh, Jamie and FCU, are big fans of Duke. Um, and this was um, a stellar year for Duke um, and on a couple of different levels that I'll share. And by the way, Duke's results came out today on IV Day. Um, so I think they recognize their place in the universe and rightly so released their results on uh, on this special day. I love um, that. Yeah, they, 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 know, they know who they're playing with. You know, they're punching above their weight and they belong in this class. And let me tell you why. So we had early indications that Duke really belongs in this class of Ivy League schools uh, for a couple of reasons. In the early round, um, applications went up a dramatic 29%, right? So in a year on year, so just from last year, suddenly, you know, 30% more people were applying wow. to Duke, which is absolutely That's insane. crazy. Their early round acceptance rate actually fell to 13%, which is lower than several IVs. So they actually beat out Brown and Dartmouth in the early round in terms of how selective they were. Um, and this immediately piqued my interest. I was like, okay, I gotta see what Duke's gonna do on IV day. Um, and it's pretty fascinating. So the regular round also saw a surge in applications, not as much as 30%, so not as crazy as that, but they did see 8% uptick in wow. the number of applications in regular round from last year. Um, and so what does that mean for Duke, right? Uh, I think FC mentioned this earlier, but their overall acceptance rate was a record low of 5.1% in 2024. They actually beat out Brown for the first time ever, right? So Brown was just a little bit higher than that in terms of the acceptance rate. So this is an incredibly selective school um, very much beating out, you know, at least Brown, maybe a couple other IVs as well. Um, and the amount of interest even we see at Crimson uh, from parents, from students, for Duke as a university um, is entirely consistent, I think, with the data that we're seeing here. Um, so Duke certainly deserves that IV designation um, is what I'm seeing. One thing that I love about Duke, right, is they have merit-based scholarships, which is a huge deal because you can, if, if you just hustle hard, you know, become an amazing profile, you can actually go to college for free through things like the Robertson Scholarship, um, which is an amazing full ride scholarship. We've sent many kids there, you know, folks like Gia, who's now at McKinsey, New York, or Antonia, um, uh, Duncan Parsons, another good example, an amazing entrepreneur out of California, um, building an awesome business. Duke actually is playing to win. Uh, and they get kids from other Ivy League schools like Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, by um, offering those merit-based scholarships, uh, like for example, the Robertson, the Cash, many other things, the Moorhead. These are great uh, ways to make it happen. I was there recently visiting my student, uh, Gia, and they have this ridiculous dining hall that is like, I think it was $200 million, you get sushi, you can get ice cream, you can get, you know, this like hardcore Chipotle competitor Mexican. It's really quite delicious. And it's very, you know, very impressive stuff. Uh, not a bad place at all. It's kind of like Stanford meets Yale is how I would describe Duke's campus. absolutely incredible so anyway it sounds like we're all big fans of duke we recognize this rightful place in the world um and we're certainly seeing at crimson a ton of interest for that school and we fully support it so that's the first thing that i thought was really interesting is just that surge in applications and that record low acceptance um the second thing that i want to touch on i want to go to you know i just talked about a school that doesn't technically have that IV designation there's a school out there that definitely has that IV designation and that's harvard i see a lot of harvard swag um, uh, right now on the screen in front of me with Jamie and FC, um, you know, all three of us that actually uh, either attend, they have attended the school, so I know it has a, a, a very dear place in all of our hearts. Um, but Harvard's gone through a lot this year, right? Um, and I think we saw that in the early round. So uh, pretty shockingly, in the early round, we saw the number of applications drop by 17%. Again, these like double-digit numbers I'm talking about, like Duke going up by 29%, Harvard coming down by 17%. That's not a normal admission cycle. Um, that's pretty crazy stuff going on out there, uh, which is why we're like keenly trying to analyze all of this data. Um, so 17% drop in applications in the early round. Um, as Jamie mentioned, a lot of that um, folks suspect is to do with a lot of the controversy that happened after the October 7th uh, attacks on Israel, right, and Harvard's response uh, in reaction to that. There were a lot of the piece around the congressional testimony. Um, and so generally, uh, uh, we were very interested to see, you know, what happened in the early round with Harvard um, and whether we see that reflected kind of in the regular round. So Harvard did fare a little bit better in the regular round. They did still see applications drop by 3% though, right? Wow, so not, wow. So not as big as the 17% in the early round, uh, but 
still a three percent crop um, in the regular round. Um, and while Harvard has traditionally always boasted that lowest acceptance rate, right, like one of the most selective schools in the world, um, this year's rate of three point six percent actually puts it at spitting distance of Yale. Three, Yale was three point seven percent, and Columbia was three point eight percent. So suddenly you're taking a school that has always been like you know markedly different in terms of selectivity, and now it's kind of clumped in with Yale and Columbia, um, which is pretty fascinating to see. And so. This is a trend that's been going over over the last two years, where Harvard's total applications have come down ever so slightly. The acceptance rate has been ticking up a little bit, um, and it will be interesting to see if this trend like continues in future years, um, or whether we're going to see some stabilization here as well. Um, so, very interesting stuff coming in uh, coming in from Harvard. I always thought that uh, you know these universities at the top end are almost bulletproof. You know, you see technology companies rise and fall, like Intel, for example, you know, the rise of NVIDIA. Um, but these top universities are such entrenched players where the alumni wanted to do well, the professors wanted to do well, the students wanted to do well. Uh, a lot of the, you know, leading presidents or, you know, political figures went to these schools. And so it's very hard to dislodge them. But Harvard's definitely taken a lot of missiles this year. But still, great to see that amazing selectivity. And the students we're seeing getting in are absolutely incredible. We just had a student, Slayton, get into Harvard and Duke for neuroscience. Huge shout out to you, Slayton. Wow. Very, very awesome. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, Harvard still is, is number one, right, uh, in terms of selectivity. Like, you know, it, it, you know, you may have a couple of those others kind of get uh, closer in terms of selectivity, right? Like I mentioned, Yale, Columbia, uh, but Harvard's still got that 3.6% kind of uh, admissions rate, which means that they're getting the cream of the crop. And so um, nothing is really changing there. And uh, it's going to be an interesting. Um, it's interesting to see the events kind of continue to unfold uh, with Harvard um, and just the place that it uh, has on the world stage. Curious, anyone in our listeners right now live, anyone, you know, hear back from schools today, anyone actually get a Harvard or a Duke offer, uh, a very rare kettle of fish, throw in any mission stories. We'd love to hear them, uh, whatever they are. We'll give you some tips whether we need to get you off that wait list or, you know, you want advice on Harvard's dining hall. We're, we're here for it. Uh, back to you, Akesh. Yeah, no, great. swag uh, i purchased this harvard swag actually for my first harvard yale uh, football game right that was that was the time where i realized like all right i, re I really need to break out like my harvard pride um so it is natural for me to touch on yale next right that rivalry is fierce um and there's some interesting things going on uh with yale this year so we actually didn't see a big change um year on year in terms of their early round applications so about the same number of students were applying in the early round to yale however interestingly Yale decided to reduce the size of their early round class by about 100 students, which is quite significant for an early round, right? Early round, you typically take about a third of your students. So in Yale's case, it's around 700. So going from a class, you know, an early round class size of 800 to 700 um, is fairly significant. And so their early acceptance rate did drop. Um, we saw a similar thing happen in the regular round. So Yale is actually contracting the size of its overall class. Um, and that is a big contributor to the reason why it's getting a lot more selective. And so uh, Yale reduced its overall class size by 6% this year, right, which is uh, pretty significant, like, you know, year on year. Um, and so the combined effect of more people applying to Yale and the fact that they're actually choosing to have a smaller, tighter net class overall um, means that its acceptance rate fell from 4.4% last year to 3.7% this year. Wow. Um, and, that, and that's why it's kind of in spitting distance of Harvard. So really interesting that, like, while Harvard got a little bit easier to get into this year, just a little bit, right? It's still obviously the toughest. Um, Yale actually uh, got a lot harder, a lot harder this year uh, to get into. And so I've been seeing a couple of our Crimson kids uh, come through, get into Yale. Um, it's, it's a pretty large number, honestly, at this point. It's, it's hard to keep up. And, and maybe there's some folks on here as well who, who got some Yale admins. But like, kudos to you because uh, it just got a lot harder this year to get into Yale than it was in any prior year. And, you know, Yale's often considered the happy Ivy. Kids at Yale are very, very happy. I think if one of our um, OG students, Kenio, who got into Yale and Harvard and chose Yale um, with his uh, really careful analysis of the two different environments. And another legend, actually, this guy called Ben, who inspired me uh, to apply to Yale in the first place. I know he's your old classmate, uh, or rather Auckland year group here, Akesh. Um, and he got into a bunch of different schools and he, choos he chose Yale, um, really thinking the school's campus spirit and excitement was, you know, it was amazing. Um, no surprises, Yale also has some pretty brilliant pizza. I love Pepe's Pizza over at Yale. 
it's a oh making me hungry right now. I'm gonna have to get some pizza later on. Yeah, no, no, no for sure. Couldn't agree with more with uh, with all of that, including the pizza comment. By the way, um, just just a ridiculous thing, a ridiculous piece of news. Um, one of I'm one of our students just got into uh, seven of the eight Ivy League schools and was waitlisted on the eighth. So she landed offers to uh, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Dartmouth, Cornell, Brown. Um, am I missing any of them? Wow, that that's insane. Um, that and is Penn. and Penn and Penn. Wow, that's super crazy. Um, awesome stuff. Congratulations, guys. I can see one of our team, George Baxter, going nuts in in, in the comments as he rightfully should. Uh, that is truly impressive. It's very hard in the world of Ivy League admissions to get into more than one school. Typically, a lot of kids just get into one. Um, some kids punch up to getting to two or three, but getting to seven out of eight is super difficult. Super difficult. Yeah, I think just just looking at the numbers here. I mean, like the numbers we're talking about per school, you know, three point six percent at admit rate for Harvard, three point seven percent for Yale, three point eight for Columbia, five point two for Brown. Like the math's just like the, the math for that student to get into seven out of the eight. Um, you just don't see sweeps like that as often these days with these rip or below admit rates, right? The ability to get into the majority of the Ivy League. Um, like outstanding. I don't even know. I don't even know what else to say to, to that result. Uh, frankly, uh, but so just like huge congratulations uh, uh, over over there because uh, just wow. By the way, uh, we're gonna bring we're gonna bring in George, who knows the student who just got into seven Ivy League schools and got waitlisted. He's coming along. Uh, he's gonna share some hot insights. I don't know where he is on this lovely Thursday night at ten o'clock, um, but he's coming in. He's coming here for you guys, uh, and he's gonna give some insights. Very cool. Amazing. Very cool. Right. Very cool. Is George ready to come in? Uh, I think he'll join the party, Akish. Um, but um, I'll, I'll I'll let you know when it pops up on the screen. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, why, why don't I hit you guys with one final comment? Um, Go for it. Comment, Drop some knowledge. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this this one I know everyone has uh, somewhere in the back, either in the back of their mind or the front of their mind. Um, it's hard to ignore, which is everything that happened over the last six to twelve months um, in terms of affirmative action um, and the Supreme Court ruling. Right. I think. Um, it is an incredibly turbulent time as it uh, as it pertains to um, race in general, race, uh, you know, with, whether that can be used as an admissions criteria, how that's going to impact the composition of class sizes these days. Um, so a couple interesting tidbits. So Harvard, in a break from president, for the first time in history, has decided that they will not be releasing any racial and ethnic data um, on IV day. And so uh, there are a lot of reasons uh, that people may suspect for this. One is that the admissions office actually did not have any information um, on the race of any of the applicants that applied, right? So that information was completely removed uh, from all applicants uh, starting this year. Um, but of course, the university is also increasingly wary of, um, of litigation from anti-affirmative action groups, right? And so uh, certainly the school is quite wary of releasing this data. It, it is going to come eventually in the summer. We don't have a ton of it right now. Um, we do have some stats that have come through, right? And so, for example, Harvard mentioned that in its early round, uh, close to 16% of accepted applicants came from a first-generation background. That was an increase uh, from the year prior, right? A 1.5 percentage point increase from the year prior. You see these schools like Harvard, Yale, the Ivies, really working hard to reach out to students of all backgrounds, of all diversity. Um, that was an immediate reaction that all of the schools made once this ruling came out in June of last year. Um, but in terms of how that's actually impacting the composition of, uh, of the class sizes um, and the distribution and the makeup, uh, that's yet to be seen at least for a couple of months. Um, there was a lot of interesting stuff that went down uh, during that Supreme Court ruling, right? So, I mean, Harvard wrote a Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, David Card, who did a bunch of simulations for them and showed that um, you know, if race was removed completely from the admissions process, then the size of the African American student group within Harvard would have halved, right? And that was what Harvard brought in as kind of the expert witness. Um, it's the, I guess we'll see kind of, you know, once the summer comes around and once the data fully gets released, whether that actually plays out or have these schools been able to actually figure out means and ways uh, to reach out to these students. You know, Harvard, Yale both changed a lot of their essay questions in response mm -hmm. to the ruling as well to really get a better understanding of a student's background without actually having them designate their race on an application. So these universities are smart. Um, they really want to get that diversity. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether they, um, whether the class try to, uh, class uh, composition changes or not. Um, all right, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Um,
because um, I know it's going to be exciting to dig into this next student story, right? Um, Thanks so much, Akesh. Amazing. And as one Harvard grad leaves, another arrives with George Baxter, one of the legends of Crimson. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what incredible news, what incredible news, she, um, what can I say, she just put together a quite outstanding application, but really, do you know what, it was a testament to, like, the, the, the very detailed work that we did together, right, like, coming into the multiple meetings that we had with her and her, and, her mom, and, and, and figuring out exactly how we're going to describe her activities, exactly how we're going to order them, exactly how we're going to cover all of who she is through the essays, making sure that we get that coverage. Um, I, we worked so meticulously on this to ensure that she that she that she got in. So you know, wow, what, what an honor! What Incredible, honor George. To, uh, so tell us a bit. Tell us a bit about you know any particular candidacy highlights, anything on the extracurriculars, honors, academics that you know particularly you think is spicy, or the essays. I know our audience is super fascinated. What does it take in two thousand and twenty-four to get into seven Ivy League schools? That's awesome. That's incredible. Wow. What a, what a powerful story. Um, yeah. So, you know, to, to hopefully to make that uh, all eight Ivy League, uh, you know, Grand Slam full, uh, she will need to write uh, the letter of continued interest, right? Um, and how, how would you advise uh, people in the audience here who might need to write, uh, you know, a solid uh, letter of continued interest? Explaining how excited we would be to take that offer, um, and certainly for you know a student who's 
time to, to argue it may be the case that that's not choice. So indicating that that's not this is my top choice, I would absolutely accept this offer if given me the offer. Share a little bit more about what we. Hi, Sarah. Uh, share a little bit more about what we um, are doing, uh, what we've done thus far since we applied, right? Because, uh, I mean, inevitably, when you're a student who's getting into almost all of the IVs and getting waitlisted by just one, you've probably been doing a lot since you applied as well. So, sharing that information with them, any you know, new achievements, new updates, and also just getting into the weeds of what aligns you with Harvard. You know, most students, when they apply to Harvard, if they were asked, why are you going there? They're going to say, because it's Harvard. But when it comes to writing letters of continued interest, how are we going to differentiate ourselves from the crowd if we truly get to the heart of how your values and what you care about aligns with Harvard's values and what they care about? So I would say what we're going to do, she doesn't know this yet because I haven't had a conversation with the student quite yet, but we will write that letter. And then I think it's really good for them to write a second kind of follow-up at the end just to give them a, a sense of well, what we should do during April, reach out to students, reach out to professors, reach out mm -hmm. to people on campus who can actually give us some more insights of what it's like to be a student at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like for my students to send that second letter later on in the month, just before my first, to say, oh, I've been able to chat with person X and person Y, and they've actually given me some really interesting insight. And I feel that that has given me more evidence that ever before that I align with um, with Harvard's values. So we'll, we'll be doing a lot, for sure, to, to try and make that eight out of eight. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's his hoping. His hoping. George, I, I think you that, that might make national headlines, uh, <laughs> maybe international. It's very, it's very hard to pull that quick clean sweep. And, uh, clean sweep. And by the way, just so you guys know in the audience, all of us in the call are what we call strategists here at Crimson. A strategist is, is our name for an admissions counselor, someone who helps you with the application essays, the extracurriculars, the candidacy, everything required to build that elite profile to go ahead and get in. We've sent more than 800 kids to the Ivy League. Just this year, the tally's up to now 120 Ivy League offers, 2024 alone. So um, amazing, George. Thanks so much for, the, for all those insights. Uh, we appreciate it. And with that, we welcome a, a rock star of Crimson, one of our platinum strategists, our highest level, Sarah she is a Harvard grad. Not only is she a Harvard grad, but she has done the Harvard double, getting her son into Harvard, who's now a senior there. And she's got the coolest Instagram handle to, to, to beat uh, Ivy Mama. So over to you, Sarah. Any insights from Ivy Day? Thank you, George. See you, George. Have a good night, mate. Thank you. Enjoy the fun. As Jamie said, hi. But I, I, I promised to everyone uh, in the audience we, we didn't really uh, stage this. But you know, happened every uh, guest so far who happened to join us uh, is is uh, a graduate from Harvard. That's uh, that's just incredible. Um, especially double Harvard. That's uh, that's that's amazing, Sarah. Totally incredible. And, and, and before we jump in, uh, Sarah, I guess this, uh, another uh, amazing piece of news just came in uh, in our in our results channel. Um, so one of our students got into three uh, institutions. So in my, so just now we talk about getting all uh, eight IVs. That's one type of Grand Slam. I guess the other uh, type of Grand Slam, at least in my heart, is the three top institutions that I love the most. And, 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 and Jamie, I guess, do you want to guess? Uh, what they so, are so you know our man here fc he's a junkie for mit you know he loves mit uh like a religion so uh you know a lot of our students some like mit some like the more balanced ivies but for fc mit is top tier s tier can't beat so i have i have a feeling mit might feature in this story yeah totally so uh this student uh applied to stanford uh, our year early got in and then uh, earlier this month, I uh, was accepted by Stanford and just a couple hours ago was accepted by Harvard. So now I guess there's really, uh, you know, a tough decision uh, among these three uh, in incredible uh, institutions. So I really, really happy, uh, feel happy for the student. And I guess uh, it's, it's definitely, a, you know, a, a very lucky problem to have. 
How how would you? It, it, it certainly is. I mean, when we have that kind of privilege and that kind of um, decision to make, and um, I actually have got some experience with that from a one of my students who worked in a chat tomorrow morning because he has a similar dilemma, if you will, choosing between Stanford, to which he was accepted in the RA round, Columbia, and Penn. Um, and so, you know, again, a nice problem to have. Um, and at that point, you can't go wrong with any decision. You have to really dig into the, the weeds about, you know, the program and the particular professors, as well as the quality of life and the culture of the campus yeah. and the particular school. Because, again, academically, you can't go wrong with any of those choices. So that's certainly what my student and I are going to talk about. And, and FB and, and your um, example of MIT and Harvard, certainly different schools, not too far away from each other, of yeah. course, um, but definitely different vibes and different campus culture. Um, and it's great for students to consider what do I want my typical day to be like and feel like on these campuses and sort of use that to guide the decision as well as the more hardcore academics. Definitely that. I guess uh, for those of you who are holding multiple offers, uh, one of the very important opportunities to take advantage of is the admitted student weekend day, uh, weekend or, or day, uh, depending on which school uh, you get admitted to. Uh, use that opportunity, really be on campus, meet your future professors and your future classmates, um, and then that will give you a much better idea um, the, you know, on the people and the environment that you're going to spend a lot of time with. Um, I guess that's also, yeah, something that a lot of our students ask us uh, when they do have some uh, especially close options on hand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Harvard really pulls out all the staffs for visit pass. Um, lots of fun there. And I know the students on campus really love showing off, you know, the activities and what makes Harvard so unique. Um, and I think there really is no substitute for that visceral reaction you get when you set foot on campus. Even if you've visited before as a prospective student, just really taking a look at it again through a different lens as someone who's been accepted to the school is really valuable and a great way to make that decision. Incredible, totally. What what what, what are the most um, you know your favorite stories um, you know with students this admission cycle? Oh gosh, I have so many. Um, I have to admit, I've, I've shed a few tears and my eyes are red just because I've been so so pumped tonight. I got a FaceTime call from one of my favorite students and her entire extended family, um, which which really warmed my heart. And she she got into Penn, got into Duke, got into Georgetown, got into Wesleyan, got into William and Mary. Um, and she's an incredibly talented poet. Um, and, and so as the, the English major in me, that really did make me feel great that someone in the humanities who really has an exceptional talent can, can get an offer from some of these top schools. Um, so that was a really rewarding story for me. And then I have another student, um, my student from California, who again has Stanford, Columbia, and Penn to choose from. Um, he was just such a humble, he is such a humble young man, and it it was all I could do to even convince him to apply to his dream school in the early round. And I remember just that look of trepidation and pure fear when he clicked submit with me on the, on the call, on our Zoom call, and it, and it came through um, for him. And, you know, I, I've seen him grow in his confidence through this journey from that, you know, very humble and reluctant young, young man who clicked submit in the early after round to someone who is still humble, and, and, and lovely in that way, but um, he's, he's got a lot more confidence and he knows he belongs at these universities. He truly earned his spot. He has got such a nuanced perception and understanding of political science and has such a huge heart um, that he's going to make such a vast contribution to whichever school is lucky enough to enroll him. Mm, totally. And, and uh, speaking of political science, um, you know, what are, um, you know, some of the, I guess, most common uh, academic interests or potential majors that you're seeing, you know, successful students kind of uh, indicate on their applications? Political science is a very popular one. Economics is a popular one as well. Um, and public health and, and biological sciences are very popular. But again, you know, with all my students, I always try to come up with some sort of niche or, you know, maybe interdisciplinary angle. Um, and, and that's something you know that I, I really enjoy trying to to identify for my students. So we try to make it a little bit more unique than just applying to some of those really popular, oversaturated majors. But again, you know, sometimes students want to apply to that major, and and, and certainly you know that's an authentic approach that I support as well. 
for sure. And some people ask, um, you know, because they really struggle to uh, make a choice, they, you know, they, they feel very tempted to uh, put, you know, undecided um, uh, on their application. How, how do you see that? Definitely, definitely, definitely. I hundred percent agree. I think Jamie has a, also very has a very strong opinion on this. But I, I guess personally, um, I, I feel that it's critical when you apply to colleges to really share a vision, right? Yeah. You know, what what are you hoping to achieve? What kind of difference you're hoping to make? By the way, and this guys, way, I have to know. interrupt you. We just had a hundred and forty <laughs> Ivy League offers. Um, amazing stuff. The new, we are, that's that's a that's a record for us by quite a big margin actually for this year. And um, we're actually up to one hundred and forty one now. Um, and, wow. uh, you know, we haven't even heard from Stanford yet. Very, very exciting stuff. Sorry. You, you go back to it. Oh yeah. Um, in incredible. I, I guess, um, you know, while we're on this topic, uh, we have someone who just got into, uh, the Barnard Columbia engineering program, um, on a scholarship, which is incredible. Somebody from California getting into, uh, Penn, Pomona, USC, Georgetown, CMC, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah, that that's awesome. You know, we've got somebody from China getting to NYU for engineering. Actually, two of them uh, getting to NYU engineering from China. Uh, somebody from Japan getting into Rice, Cornell, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's um, it, it, one more Columbia here. Another one from the West Coast getting to Columbia and Penn. Um, another student from China getting to Princeton, Emory. Um, yeah, it's uh, that that's basically, you know, the results just over the last uh, little, uh, I guess, you know, little while when we are having our, you know, fun conversations. It's such an exciting time for, for parents and children who have worked so hard. And um, I mean, I remember vividly with my own kids and, you know, I, I'm so proud of my students for, for really investing in this process and putting in so much work and effort and blood and sweat and tears and we've gone through a lot together um and you know again this is just um, such a validation for everything that they've done 100 percent, 100 percent. it's so exciting and i guess just back to uh, that that uh, that that last question, yeah. So I think you know, when applying to college, it's important to share that vision uh, and and really uh, clarify, you know, what you're hoping to achieve and how you can make a difference. And it's really hard to do that, I guess, uh, when you uh, basically say that, okay, I, I'm not too sure, right? So it's it's hard, it's, it's a bit harder to do that. So it's always uh, more interesting to have a holistic plan. And when we work with students from I don't know when they are in grade nine or even even younger. We uh, work with students to really explore the different um, potential majors because many people kind of come in. They know um, the common ones like math or business, economics, or um, you know history or something like that. But you know, few of them really had a lot of exposure to you know science, technology, and society. For example, health and society. Um, or I don't know urban studies or uh, gender studies, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we we work with students to help them explore and really uh, become more and more, uh, I guess, proficient uh, in the field that they 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 identify to have some passionate a uh, passion, and then gradually really deepen that uh, expertise and and have, have a very clearly defined uh, value proposition. And I think that 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 uh, that's usually a lot more memorable. Uh, in the yeah. application process. Yeah. It's a really important, important part of the process. I mean, so much of college admissions is about the, that that um, promise of potential um, in a student. It's not just what a student has done in high school. It's business officers projecting um, that capacity to excel in college and beyond. So, um, oh my goodness, we have a new... <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Lola. She's a, a big fan of Columbia, and she decided oh. to join the stream. <laughs> <laughs> right now, for sure. <laughs> uh, Lola's a regular fixture on our Crimson streams. She's quite a social media star. Aww. <laughs> I so, think Lola's daddy. I, I am. I am. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a. 
I'm a slack daddy though. His mummy is much better at uh, taking care of her than I am. Um, I, I like to give her some good scratches and you know take her for good walks. But uh, I, I, uh, it's it's an imbalanced team for some of the uh, more more messy stuff. Amazing, amazing. So uh, everyone on the stream, I want you guys to remember that tomorrow the adventure continues because Stanford is coming out tomorrow. And actually, one of the interesting things that's happened in the last decade in college missions is although we're all big Harvard diehard fans. Um, uh, Stanford has actually really risen up the ranks and particularly for kids who love entrepreneurship, technology, you know, computer science, all these things, it's pretty hard to beat. So, um, uh, we will be seeing a lot of kids tomorrow waiting for Stanford thinking, you know, whether they should take an Ivy offer or Stanford. So huge shout out to our kids for waiting for those things. Um, and you know, it's pretty bold how Stanford basically has their own special day. They don't, they don't compete with the Ivies. They have their own day. Uh, a little bit of, you know, side eye shy from Stanford. Of course, yep. <laughs> amazing, amazing, good stuff. Alrighty, well, it's been an awesome stream and a super congrats to everyone around the world who's applied to schools. If you're joining us today and you're thinking about applying in a couple of years' time, um, hopefully you took some big lessons from the stream today. Um, as always, we're here to help you get into these dream schools. Uh, there's an amazing community around Crimson and a big congrats to our families all around the world on a record Ivy Day with 141 Ivy League offers in one year and counting, which is a world record in our industry. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks so much, everyone listening. Have a great night. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See you, Sarah. Alrighty, to our fans on YouTube, I know we did a lot of interviews on Instagram, uh, but thanks for bearing with us. And do go ahead and follow Crimson Education on Instagram. Um, that's a great place where we do a lot of live streams. And, you know, even Lola's tired, so it's clearly time to wrap things up. Have a good night, guys. See you later.